Well, good morning, and, and thank you very much for this invitation to, uh, to speak. I, I'm really pleased to be here, um, firstly, because this is a subject I'm very passionate about, but secondly, I'm, I'm genuinely keen to align myself and to give any support I can to organizations such as Roots of Empathy and the very important work that they do and all of you do in helping our kids become all that they can be because it's um, absolutely at the heart of health and happiness in our societies. I want to start by saying a few thanks. Uh, my colleague Shana from Public Health Ontario, who's here, she helps me uh, prepare the many, many talks that I uh, give every, every year. Uh, two colleagues who are not here, Ingrid Tyler will be known to many of you if you're from Ontario. Um, she does a lot of work on the early years and is a real superstar in this, in this area. Um, Natasha is also a colleague of mine and works on immunization. And you might think, why on earth is Peter talking about immunization this morning? Bear with me. I want to try an idea out on you. But let's start with a little bit about why violence matters the cost of violence around the world, and what we can do to prevent violence. Now, as you heard from my introduction, my career has been about half leadership positions and half academic positions. And when I used to more regularly teach medical students, I used to ask them what they thought the biggest killers in the developing world were. And, they, and, and here are five of the biggest killers. And they all used to get HIV AIDS. They virtually all would get both tuberculosis and malaria. Not that many would think of road traffic accidents and virtually none would think of violence. And yet violence kills one and a half million people a year in the world. And when I first saw that figure, I think I assumed that that was probably organized conflict. That was probably wars between nations. In actual fact, it's not. In an average year, only about 150,000 of that 1.5 million die in organized conflict. The rest are homicides, suicides and homicides. And that's a startling burden of disease on a global scale that we really should take just as seriously as we take HIV AIDS, tuberculosis or malaria. The other thing I used to, to do because I was kind of mean when I was a professor was I used to put this slide up, but I would cover up the top bit. And I would say to the students, the darker the shading of the country, the more prevalent the condition. In other words, the more of it there is. What is the condition? And they would look at the map, and they would see South Saharan Africa, and they would see Central America and South America, and they would usually start with something like TB. And then I would say, no, no, no. And then they would say AIDS, and I would say, yeah, good guess as well, but no. And then they would get into these more and more exotic tropical diseases, which frankly I can't even spell, and some of them I hadn't heard of, but they were bright students. And then I would say, no, this is homicide. This is murder. So the darker the shading of the country, the higher the homicide rate. And to cut a long story short, my argument to them would be that homicide is a disease of one, poverty, and two, inequality. So like many other things that public health worry about, Homicide is a disease of poverty 
and inequality. The other thing that's very important to remember is this. Look, I'm a public health doctor. I'm trained in epidemiology. Let, let, me, let me let you into a secret. Public health people are a bit odd. Okay? We're a bit odd. We like death. Now, this isn't because we're ghoulish. We like death because it's easy to count. So even my least bright former student at St. Andrews, if you took him and his best friend and you put them in a room with a dead body, they would generally agree that this was a dead person. Okay? If you took those two same students and put them in a room with a live person, you wouldn't get agreement. You'd actually have three different versions of what was wrong. They would disagree with each other. The patient would have a go. Everybody, like nobody would agree, okay? So the point is that death is easy to count. Injury short of death, for various reasons, is much, much harder to get hold of. So even in war zones, even in places like Iraq, at the height of the troubles, it was possible to do some very good studies about the burden of disease. Because people would literally go to the mortuary every morning and count the bodies. So the rather famous paper in The Lancet that actually tried to enumerate the number of people who had died following the trouble, following the overthrow of the government in Iraq, that's what they did. But we all know that violence is a lot more than that. That thankfully most violence does not end in death. But nevertheless, it does do a lot of damage. And who are these victims of violence who are invisible? They're largely women and children behind closed doors. Now, don't get me wrong, I know that tragically many women are killed by their male partners. But much, much more common is the behind closed doors, coercive control, often then leading to violence, which is much, much harder to get hold of. And so when we count the bodies, we're only seeing the tip of the iceberg. And if you look at this, you can see that a vast swathe of violence, particularly against women and children, goes either unreported or underreported. So what can we do about this? Well, for many years, Karen and I and others have worked with the World Health Organization. And I think they have done a remarkable job. And I don't always say this about the World Health Organization. But I think they have done a remarkable job with a very small number of staff based in Geneva. There are actually three whole-time equivalents in Geneva and, and one member of staff who often covers other things as well in each of the regional offices working on violence. That's about it. And yet they've done a fantastic job of actually bringing violence to the attention of the world community. If any of you followed the release of the new Sustainable Development Goals by the United Nations, what you will see is that threaded through those are many which either very explicitly talk about violence or very clearly relate to violence, particularly violence against women and children. So a small number of dedicated people within WHO calling on willing volunteers have over the last 15 years really driven this agenda. If you go to their website, you'll find a couple of good reports that actually sum up progress. This is a picture of their website, just to um, show you that it's there. Uh, they, they actually call it the Violence Prevention Alliance. Um, the World Health Organization is a member state, UN organization. Sometimes when they need just a little bit more freedom, they create uh, 
what I would term a wholly owned subsidiary, which is just slightly at arm's length from the WHO. Violence Prevention Alliance is one such example, and that's what's driven a lot of this work. This is unashamed advertising. You see, I've learned, I've moved to North America. You have to become self-promoting. So I, unashamed advertising. Um, it, it, don't, Oxford University Press would be cross at me, but don't go buy it, okay? You don't need to buy it. You don't need to spend $200 or whatever it is. But I just want you to know it exists. Because what Kathy and I tried to do in this rapidly fe developing field of violence as a public health issue is while we still could was to put our arms around all of the people who were involved in this and all of the evidence we could get hold of and squeeze it into a book before it was too late. And I say that in, the, in, in a really positive sense, which is that I think if we were starting this project now, it would already be too late because there are so many more people becoming interested and active in this area. But when we started pulling together this book, we reckoned we pretty much could contact everyone who was research active in the area of violence as a public health issue. So some of the evidence, if you're interested in there. Uh, Karen's pulling a face. She doesn't like this picture of her. Um, and I'm now going to make it worse by embarrassing her. It's, it's actually not often that you get uh, to talk in front of someone who's not only a friend, but, but actually a hero of mine. Uh, John Carnican and Karen, I really do think, are public health heroes, which is kind of interesting because they were both in the police at the time they started getting into this. And the story is kind of weird. And I had just been appointed as Scotland's deputy chief medical officer. And of course, I was sitting in there thinking about pandemic influenza and alcohol and smoking and all these things I was meant to be thinking about. And my secretary comes in and she says, um, Peter, there's a murder detective outside to see you. And <laughs> my, my immediate response was, I didn't do it. <laughs> Or, or, or actually, as we would say in Scotland, it wasn't me. <laughs> and anyway, not only was there a murder detective, but there was also Karen, and the two of them came in. And thankfully, they weren't trying to apprehend me. Uh, what it was is they had done a rather remarkable thing. So John was, he's now retired, but he was a long-serving homicide detective who had the most amazing clear-up rate uh, it, I can't remember, it was like 95% or something. So basically, if you killed somebody in the west coast of Scotland, John was going to get you. It just wasn't worth killing someone. John would catch you, okay? But he had this kind of interesting thing that happened to him one day. He had occasion to speak to the family of a young man who'd just been killed, but also on the same day, the family of a young man who had just been sent to prison for a very long time for committing such a crime. And what struck John was not how different the two experiences were, but how very similar they were. Both families, both families had lost a son to violence, one to the grave and one to long-term incarceration. And he, he did what I think is still, a, a, I still think is an amazing thing. Can you imagine if you've been really, really good at something for about 30 years, and one day you think, I'm not sure I'm doing the right thing? Well, that's what happened. And John said, I'm catching killers. I'm not preventing any killings. And so he did the smart thing, which was to speak to Karen. And, and Karen will tell you her past, but she has this fascinating, interesting, she's done so many different things. And Karen was a, a, an analyst, a senior analyst with the police at the time with a background in forensic psychology and a hands-on background in nursing, in the emergency room, and all of this fantastically relevant stuff. And between them, 
they hatched this idea to found the Scottish Violence Reduction Unit with the idea of reducing violence. And they went to the uh, chief constable at the time, persuaded him it was a good idea, persuaded him to back them. And then they started going around building support. And so I was just one of a number of people who they called on to try and build support. And one of the first, and I still think um, incredibly interesting things they did, was to run a gang intervention in Glasgow. Glasgow is Scotland's biggest city, population near a million, with a very, very long history of youth gangs and violence. In some way, it's what we would term recreational violence. So if you were fortunate enough to be brought up in a family where there were, lot, there were lots of activities going on, probably as a kid you did, I don't know, soccer or softball or tennis or music lessons. Or These kids didn't have this. They often came from pretty dysfunctional homes. They lived in a great deal of poverty and suffered a huge amount of social exclusion. And so what they indulged in was recreational violence. And so the way that would work is, you know, this week, this table here, we'd go attack these guys there, but maybe next weekend we'd get together with them and attack these guys here. And sadly, a number of them would die as a result. And so John and Karen designed this intervention that essentially brought all of these gang members together and gave them a choice. Either the police could continue to chase them and track them down and imprison them, or they could start their lives again. And these little cards were central to that, because when you rang that number, somebody would meet you at an agreed time and place informally and would get you to do the deal. And the deal was you sign up that you're not going to indulge in gang violence and you're not going to carry a weapon. And in response, you get access to a whole lot of good stuff. And the whole lot of good stuff is, is completing your education. It's help from social services. It's help from health. It could even involve rehousing, if that's what was necessary, to move you on from the trouble that you were in. And so we evaluated that, and we wrote it up. And I've I got to tell you, this is one of the hardest papers I've ever had to write. And it, it, wasn't that there, it wasn't that there wasn't a good story. There was a great story. The intervention was phenomenally successful. For the young men who stuck with it, it reduced their committal of acts of violence by 50%, 50%. It reduced their weapon carriage by 85%. And Karen will tell you probably when she stands up that homicides in Scotland are now at their lowest rate for 35 years. This and other things that Karen and John have done have been phenomenally successful. But you go to a journal, a scientific journal, and they say to you, hmm, very interesting but not the perfect study. And you go, oh my God, I knew it's not the perfect study, but you, you want me to randomize gang members to help or not? <laughs> How do you think that conversation is going to end? You know, that, it's not going, honestly, it's not, you know, randomized controls trials are great for old aspirin, new aspirin, which one should we use? They're really not great for something like this. Anyway, um, I suspect Martin Luther King is a hero to many people in the room. This is actually one of his less well-known sayings. Everything that we see is a shadow cast by that which we do not see. The shadow in Glasgow was that it was a post-industrial society. Fifty years ago, those young guys would have had work. 
they'd have worked in the shipyards or steelmaking or in other parts of the west coast of Scotland, they would have been in the coal mines. Their lack of educational opportunity actually would not have debarred them from access to an apprenticeship and to a living wage that was enough to give them dignity and enough, them, enough to give them a stake in society and an ability to raise a family. And so the shadow in Scotland was the collapse of those industries on the back of globalization and the fact that these young men had no stake in society. And the answer is to give them back that stake, is to give them back some dignity, to give them work training, to give them an opportunity of employment. And, we, and I don't know why we're so surprised by this, right? Because if you think about it, if we're talking at coffee time afterwards, after I ask your name, the next thing I'll probably say is, and what do you do? And you will say with some pride, I work for Roots of Empathy, or I work for this organization or that. I work with young moms. I work with young kids. And it's a, it, it, that's, that's who we are, right? It's, it, so why should we expect it to be anything different for young guys in the East End of Glasgow or young African-American men in inner city USA. Of course, the shadow that Martin Luther King was talking about was an even more insidious one, which is the USA and its history of slavery. Um, and if you just think about that for a minute, so we tend to think of globalized industries as being stuff like the, uh, you know, the, the iPhones and the computers and things that you're all on. And we, we think of the fact that, you know, the manufacture of those things are outsourced to other parts of the world. But one of the first great globalized industries was the cotton industry of the 19th century. And it was deeply, deeply exploitive. And what happened was that land was stolen from native people. The cotton was then farmed by slaves who had been stolen from Africa. The raw material was then shipped back to the northwest of England where child labor manufactured it into garments. So the idea that globalization is new is false. And the idea that exploitation is new is false. But can you imagine what a shadow this casts over the current dialogue south of the border in terms of the plight of African-American men and women in inner city areas? And the reason I mention this is that we all tend to get very enthusiastic for our own particular brand of intervention, and I'm no different from any of you. So I am a great advocate for the remarkable things that Karen and John did in Glasgow. I'm a great advocate for the remarkable things that Roots of Empathy does. But we all must be humble and say that unless we take the trouble to pause, to consider, and to understand the shadows from history that are cast, then nothing that we do will be adequate. And you could bring this story home to Canada. Think about the native peoples of what is now Canada. Think about the very difficult history that they have had. Consider the recommendations of the Truth and Reconciliation Committee. So it's not enough just to have the very focused scientific interventions within individual families. All of that is important. But it's also important 
to see the big picture and to understand the shadows of history. Now, with that backdrop, let's think a little bit about the links between poor childhood and ill health later in life. These are just pictorial examples of the way in which childhoods can go wrong. Uh, either physical abuse, psychological abuse, sexual abuse, or sometimes just witnessing those things. Perhaps having a parent who's incarcerated, perhaps living in a house where drink or drugs are a frequent cause of trouble. Uh, here's another couple of heroes of mine, Vincent Felitti and Rob Ander. They've studied this phenomenon in some depth, and if you want to find it, just look up the Adverse Childhood Experience Studies, ACE Studies, capital A, capital C, capital E, ACE Studies. There's about 35 or so good quality papers now published. A summary of them would be that if bad things happen to you as a child, your health long-term is dramatically affected. These are the things they ask, and the thing that's remarkable about these questions and this survey is not how sophisticated it is, but how simple. There are simply 10 items. You're only allowed to answer yes or no. And then what they do is they add them up. So you have a score, a, a score between zero and 10. And they ask about things like physical abuse and emotional abuse and sexual abuse, but they ask about parental divorce and separation. They ask about, well, you can see for yourself, a variety of different things. But it's a very, very simple thing. And then they correlate that to health later in life. And these have been published in good quality journals. This is good science in my judgment. These are the ones which are common. And some of them are more surprising than others. Separation and divorce at a quarter we're not surprised by. Substance abuse, probably not surprised by mental illness. Physical abuse, approaching a third. Sexual abuse, a fifth. And because of the way in which people tend to underreport, that may, if anything, be an underestimate. Now, these were not people from particularly troubled backgrounds that they were asking these questions of. Vincent, at the time, worked in San Diego in Southern California. This was a middle-class population that he started asking of these questions. And it's really interesting how traumatized some people's childhood have been, and these are the things that they're linked to. Now, let me just say at this point, epidemiologists sometimes are very guilty because they want to get their papers published of finding associations that they sort of infer are causal and they sort of suggest they're important. So, you know, this is why you get newspaper headlines that tell you you shouldn't eat more than two bits of bacon a week or whatever it is this week. You know, like, and then two weeks, uh, I don't know, two months from now, somebody will say, no, it's okay, bacon's back on again, that's good, and then it'll be something else. It'll be the pancakes that are the problem. <laughs> I want to reassure you that this stuff isn't marginal. Okay, <laughs> this is, what they found was that these conditions are many, many times more prevalent in people who've got high A scores. It's not just a little bit extra, it's a whole bunch extra. Now, some of it's kind of intuitive. Like, I get why you would have more depression, why you might have more suicidal thoughts or even commit suicide, you know, uh, complete suicide, if you've had a very traumatic childhood. It's a little bit more difficult to understand why it gives you ischemic heart disease, why it gives you cancer and strokes. But Vincent Felitti explained to me that a lot of that is mediated 
fear cigarettes, alcohol, and drugs. It's not the whole story. There's probably something else going on as well as that. And it's probably something to do with the way it affects your hypothalamic pituitary stress hormone system as a kid. And I suspect you heard yesterday about the way infant brains are affected if they actually live in neglectful households. So I guess I kind of get those bits. Here's the one I really didn't get. I didn't get the multiple sexual partners. I said, that's interesting. Why do people who have a disturbed childhood have multiple sexual partners? And he then came up with this, I, I think, utterly memorable and rather brilliant phrase. He said, Peter, you have to understand there is nothing as seductive as the cure that almost works. Think about it. There's nothing as seductive as the cure that almost works. So if you're upset and traumatized, maybe the next drink makes a difference. Maybe the next shot of drugs. Or maybe it's the next man or the next woman who somehow makes you feel validated, loved, whole, respected, until they don't because it's a cure that almost works. I think it's a very powerful phrase to consider if you really want to understand what's going on in the lives of people who've had very difficult childhoods. Now, of course, not everybody who's had a difficult childhood is, is uh, going to follow such a traumatic path. And one of the things we probably don't do well enough is to study those very remarkable people who have a tough start in life and yet develop resilience and flourish. And there are many of them, and we should probably do a better job of identifying them. Uh, th th often they're quite shy about putting their own hands up and identifying themselves. But I think if somebody wants a research challenge out there, study resilience. We should study resilience with the same enthusiasm that we study some of these deficit things. Anyway, what kind of stuff can we do to stop violence? Well, look, you guys know this better than me. I mean, Roots of Empathy has quite rightly exposed itself to a lot of evaluations. It's been written up in many very good journals. And there really is a mounting body of evidence that good quality parenting and the early development of empathy is very important in terms of that resilience that I was referring to. So what does good parenting look like? Well, it, you kind of recognize it when you see it, but you also can codify it. It's some of these things here. It's being there for a child. It's reading to a child. It's singing to a child. It's interacting with a child. It's above all listening to a child. It's appropriate physical contact with a child. It is the hugs and the kisses. And you ideally want it from both parents. So positive parenting is defined as positive, warm, and consistent. Consistent is an important word. You probably saw, I don't know, you may have seen videos yesterday about how devastating inconsistent interaction can be with babies. Did you see one of those yesterday, Mary? Yeah, okay. You know, so you can see the babies smiling and interacting. You look away, and they, they, get, they get really distressed. Uh, I, always, I always, when people do that, I always feel sorry for the, the mom as well, or the, the, because can you imagine how hard that is to do that, no, seeing that your baby is becoming distressed? But consistent parenting. Talk, play, praise, laugh, do those special things together. If you've experienced it, you know it. But imagine being brought up in a household where your mum is maybe 16 or 17 years old. She's long since been deserted by her partner. She lives in poverty in a house which is cold and moldy 
she herself had a traumatic childhood, which is why she turned to an intimate relationship very early in life. She consequently has a problem with drugs or alcohol or both. Is she well placed to do that? Not really. And, and I have the highest admiration for young women in some of Scotland's and Canada's you know, public housing estates who some of them do an absolutely remarkable job of bringing up kids successfully. But my goodness, it's difficult. You know, my wife and I are middle-class parents with all of the advantages of money and parental support and all of this stuff. And, and we still had moments with our three sons when it was hard work. And I just cannot imagine how difficult it must be in some of these adverse situations. So the journals have also picked up, and again, these are good quality journals. The journals are beginning to pick up on the importance of this stuff, why it really matters to help parents do the best job that they can. But it's not just a feel-good thing, and it's not just a thing that works. It's a thing that makes sense economically. You don't need to take my word for it. James Heckman is an economist, a professor, and he won the Nobel Prize. He's a smart guy. And what he says, basically, is that money invested early in childhood is a great investment. He's done the kind of economist thing, and he's tried to work out what the annual return is, compounded, 7 to 10%. <laughs> I mean, if you walk down the road today and there's a bank saying, we're going to give you, invest your money, we'll guarantee you 7 to 10% interest every year, compounded over the course of your lifetime. I mean, frankly, you wouldn't believe them, right? You'd think they were crooks, because that's such a phenomenal return. But this is a Nobel-winning economist saying that this is the return that you can get on early childhood investment. So the question then is, when it's the morally right thing to do, when it works, and when it makes sense economically, why are governments around the world so loath to do anything about this? I think there are various reasons. I think the first is that it does cost money. Now, I've made the case that you get that money back in spades, but you still have to find the money to begin with. You've got to invest now to save later on. Second point <clears throat> is that the places you would be taking the money from are perhaps one government department to put into another. I've worked w in or with government most of my career. I've never met a politician or a senior government official who doesn't believe in, in joined up government. They all believe in it. It's just hard to do. And there's good reasons why it's hard to do, by the way. You know, one of the things I would observe about politicians is that many of them, and you, if you never worked with them, you might not know this, but paradoxically, many of them have their closest friendships with people from other parties. That seems odd. Why would that be? It's not such a mystery, folks, when you think about it. The high flyers in one party are all in competition with each other. I've never met a politician who goes into politics thinking that, that, that he or she could not be the prime minister or the premier or the first minister. It's not the kind of profession you take up if you have much in the, you know, if you have much in the way of self-doubt, right? Because it's a really, really tough way to make a living. So often politicians, hmm, not easy. The classic UK civil service model as well means that the minister's first job is to fight on behalf of his or her department. The view that the civil servants have of their minister often depends on how well 
he or she has been able to defend the budget, build the budget, get extra resources. So for a politician to be able to say, you know what, thank you, Treasury Board, or thank you, Premier, for that offer of extra resources, but I think I would rather give it to this other department over here, because really what we should be doing is investing in early years. You've got to be an outstanding leader before you can do that. There was one of the US presidents, I, it may have been Stevenson, I can't remember, but he said within every politician is a statesman fighting to get out. And one of the things that we need to do if we're really gonna make progress with governments is help every politician find their inner statesman on this issue. I tried that line with a politician in Scotland once and he burst out laughing and he said, well, he said, I get what you mean, Peter, but he said, to be honest, if I'm not a politician over the next two years, I've got no chance of ever being a politician again, let alone a statesman, because I'll never get reelected, okay? So I, I think we should, we should realize they lead a tough life. And, and, you know, having worked with them for, as I say, a very long time, the overwhelming majority of politicians in all political parties enter politics for the right reason. They actually want to make a difference. And we should approach them with that in mind and try and help them, help them discover their statesmen. Here's the other reason, though, that people, governments, don't do this stuff. They hate the accusation that they are somehow the nanny state. So I think some of this has origins in the UK, particularly the English class system. If you are a politician in the UK with a certain background, you may well have had a nanny when you were a youngster. And a nanny was the child care giver. It was the family retainer who brought up all the kids who may well actually have brought up your mother or your father. But nanny was this very powerful figure. It was sort of benignly um, cast in the film Mary Poppins. If, you, if you've seen the film Mary Poppins, most people have that kind of all-powerful, all-wise figure. And so when senior politicians get accused of being a nanny state, they really don't like it because they fear that people are accusing them of interfering in their lives, of meddling unnecessarily within the walls of the household. They become very defensive. And often nanny statism applies not to things like parenting, but to things like perhaps the pricing of alcohol or when and where you might smoke. Or you can imagine uh, what things are regarded as safe and what things should be voluntary and what things should be compelled. But can you imagine any issue which is more likely to bring on the accusation of nanny statism than parenting? <laughs> I mean, you know, if you as a politician stand up and say, I think everybody should have parenting classes, you know, you don't have to be the smartest journalist in town to immediately come up with some sort of nanny state headline. And of course, that's what they do. Reached a bit of a zenith in Scotland, where Scotland, I, I, the Scottish government, I think, had the not unreasonable idea to say that every child should have a named person. And the idea was that there would be a person to whom the child or the parents could go and seek advice and help. And it was frankly a recognition that education and welfare and health and social services are now so complicated that many people would benefit from a navigator. And in case you think that's patronizing, I don't know if any of you have ever had the experience of trying to negotiate perhaps on behalf of either a child or an elderly relative through a plethora of services. Oh my goodness, you know, I think I'm a reasonably clever, reasonably patient guy, but trying to negotiate your way through some of those things on behalf of a, 
you know, in my case, one of my kids, and on another occasion, my father-in-law. Oh, my goodness. It's very, very complicated. So it's not an unreasonable idea. But, but the backlash against this in some parts of society is so strong that people are talking about legal challenges or even a challenge under the U uh, European human rights legislation. So it's a difficult area for people to get into. Now, I don't often say nice things about David Cameron, but he has, in fairness, on this issue, tried. Um, I think it's probably because he and others have been inspired by, you know, some of the work that you have all been involved in and that I referred to earlier. But it's interesting that even when he talks about this, you see the way it's cast? It's about how to discipline <laughs> your children. It's not about how to love your children, how to grow your children, how to help your children develop empathy. It's more about how you discipline your children. And that's probably because he probably felt that was just as far as he could go in terms of his own right-wing members of parliament. So here's an idea I want to try out on you. This is something that Shana and I have been working on. I'm not sure if it's a good idea or completely nuts. <laughs> Shana's smiling. I don't know if that's because she thinks it's a good idea or it's nuts, but we'll find out. I just think it's, I just think it's kind of interesting. So we have vaccination. And here's an honors list for vaccination in Canada. Vaccination is the single most effective, important public health measure invented. Governments around the world recognize that to such an extent that they not only pour millions of dollars into it, but when they face pushback, they fight back. And they say, no, you will get your kids immunized, or we will encourage you to get your kids immunized. So they don't caveat in the way that Cameron was around what parenting is about. They say, no, vaccination works. And they're right. I mean, look at all this good stuff it's done. No smallpox, polio almost gone, things that killed millions of kids around the world. I mean, we think, Natasha's estimate, and she is one of the world's experts on this stuff, reckons that vaccination saves two to three million lives a year. So it's a phenomenally important and effective thing to do. And look at the kind of before and after stats, you know, the rates before, the rates after. Some diseases you eliminate altogether, others you reduce to a very small level. And it's such that the government actually in this province has a whole strategy, immunization 2020. So how do, we, how do we get to those last five or 10% of people who are not immunizing their kids? Absolutely right, good thing to do. So even despite the fact that that's a highly proven, highly effective intervention, you still get some parents who push back and say, we don't want you to do that. Now, I think partly it's because people forget that these diseases used to be there. They no longer have the lived experience or the family memory that that was the case. But governments respond not by backing off, but by trying to assemble the evidence. And interestingly, the public now are responding in this way. This is my son, he may have measles and I'm angry, angry as hell. If you have chosen not to vaccinate yourself or your child, I blame you. This was a post by a woman whose child was too young yet to be immunized against measles. Her child had been exposed to measles in a doctor's waiting room because other people had chosen not to immunize their children. And so she's pushing back and she's saying, this isn't right. You don't have the liberty to take the decision on your child 
if it affects my child. How does that apply to parenting? When we look at the association between poor childhoods and involvements in gang and violence later in life, and the victims of that violence and that behavior, whether they're in the family or somebody who just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. It's interesting, right? It's interesting to consider. Because I wonder if we could come up with a way of conceptualizing early years interventions, development of empathy, good parenting, as being the social equivalent of vaccination, it could be a game changer. It could be the thing that actually changes the dialogue from why should we spend money on that to we can't afford not to spend money on that. And the argument is something that, like this, vaccination builds your resilience against communicable disease. It saves millions of, ye of lives a year. Early years education, good parenting, development of empathy is the social equivalent of vaccination. It's the closest thing we have to vaccination in terms of all that very long list of chronic diseases that I shared with you earlier. Thank you for your attention.